birds are a part of our lives, and we are a part of theirs. The birds that share our islands have come to Hawaii from all over the world. The most familiar, the ones we hear singing in our parks and squabbling in backyard trees, were brought to Hawaii by people less than 200 years ago. Native birds, the ones that were here long before people arrived, are more difficult to find. Water birds, such as the long-legged Hawaiian stilt and the Hawaiian coot, make their homes in streams, taro fields, and ponds. Native seabirds, like the dark-rumped petrel and the Newell's shearwater, spend most of their time at sea and come ashore only to have their young. The braying call of the shearwater led the Hawaiians to name the bird A'o. Migratory birds, like the kolea, or golden plover, come for the mild Hawaiian winters, but leave in the spring. Today, most of Hawaii's native birds live in upland native forests, far from our cities and towns. Most of the native birds that we have left are in high elevation rainforests that are very difficult to reach. Once you get there, it's very difficult to get through them. People basically have to go out, camp out, uh, make their way through the forests under very difficult and dangerous conditions, and try to apply some sort of uniform census method to get an idea of how many birds per area there are, what habitats are the best for the birds, and then from those data to get a total estimate of the number of birds as well as where they occur. As you leave busy highways and go deep into valleys, there's a feeling of going back in time. Remnants of old Hawaii are carried on the song of birds like the Amakihi and Apapane. Recent discoveries have taken us back to pre-Polynesian times and have shed light on one of the best kept secrets about our native birds. Scientists have made some exciting discoveries digging in limestone sinkholes that formed over 125,000 years ago. We can reconstruct from the layering of these bird bones and other uh, natural materials in the sinks the history of this area. Uh, so we don't get many uh, Polynesian, say, artifacts, don't get many fish hooks, hardly any fish hooks, other uh, implements out of these. But if you can envision the deposit in the sink, as you come up from the bottom, we'll get uh, native snails, native Hawaiian snails, and uh, bones of extinct species of birds, native species of birds, and no introduced animals. Then at a certain point, the bones of these uh, native birds keep on appearing. In other words, it's more nearer to the present in time. But all of a sudden, the land snail species uh, cut down the native species, their fewer species represented, and you get a Polynesian introduced snail in these deposits, a very small little snail. But that tells us that the Polynesians had arrived at that time. And the fact that the fossil bird bones occur in the same level as the Polynesian induced snail, not only occur in the same level, but keep on till a later time in the site, says, tells us very clearly that the Polynesians, when they arrived here, saw this amazing uh, avifauna of Hawaiian birds. Fossil finds unlock secrets to old Hawaii and reveal that many more bird species lived in the islands than was previously believed. We now know that when the Polynesians first arrived, there were at least 110 species of birds. Flightless ibis once lived in forests of Maui and Molokai, and long-legged owls and flightless geese roamed our Hawaiian forests. You can see uh, here, by comparison, the uh, leg bone of the uh, flightless goose was um, quite a bit larger, sturdier than that of the nene. But we knew it was flightless. And you say, well, this is dead. Nobody ever has any record of this bird. How do you know that the goose was flightless? Well, here's a nene wing bone. This is a larger bone of the lower arm, the wing on a nene. And in these sinks with these large leg bones, we'll find just tiny stunted 
bones. And these are fully adult uh, individuals, so on. So this is the lower arm bone, the ulna, of the flightless goose. And this is of the nene. So you can see the amazingly shortened wing that the flightless goose had. Fossil bones are silent testimony to Hawaii's rich natural heritage a heritage that includes the remarkable evolution of a group of small songbirds known as the Hawaiian honey creepers. The Hawaiian honey creepers are considered by most ornithologists to be the most interesting group of birds in the world because of their evolutionary background, their evolutionary history. They are a great example of what biologists call adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation involves the divergence from a single ancestor of many types of organisms into many different forms. Usually that divergence is prompted by adaptation to a single resource or a single type of resources in the environment. For example, in this case, food. The Hawaiian honey creepers probably evolved from a small finch-like bird. New species could arise from a finch-like ancestor if gene changes or mutations caused offspring to develop new behaviors. These behaviors would prevent them from interbreeding with other related birds. If the offspring remained isolated from the ancestral population, as they did on our islands, a new species would evolve. The finch ancestor of the honey creepers may have eaten grass seeds mutations resulting in a bill shape that allowed offspring to take advantage of new foods, such as fruits, would be passed on to new generations. Other successful mutations resulted in thick, powerful bills that enable birds to open tough seed pods and crack open hard seeds. The evolution of a long hook at the tip of a bird's bill enabled the bird to crack open a branch and feed on insects without the branch rolling out of its mouth. This group of honey creepers is known as the finch bills. As competition for food increased, birds that evolved more slender, straight, or curved bills could take advantage of new food sources. Known as the sickle bills, most of the honey creepers in this group feed on insects, although their slender bills are also used for feeding on nectar. Curved bills allowed birds to take advantage of abundant nectar and some insects in Hawaii's native forests. This group is known as the red and black honey creepers. These are just a sample of the many honey creepers that evolve in the Hawaiian Islands. With the addition of fossil finds, we now know at least 45 species of honey creepers once lived in Hawaii's forests. Over half of these species are now extinct, including the grosbeak finch and the mamo. Many others are listed by the federal and state government as endangered species. In historical times, we know of about 70 species of birds that are endemic or unique to the Hawaiian Islands. Of those 70 species, 25 have become extinct in the last 200 years. And of the 45 remaining species, about 30 are considered to be endangered. That's about half of the total number of birds that are endangered in the entire United States. This 1923 footage of an extinct flightless rail gives us only a brief glimpse of the amazing variety of unusual Hawaiian birds now gone. Found only on Laysan Island, the rail disappeared when introduced rabbits stripped the island of its vegetation. Why have so many native birds been lost to extinction? The answer lies in human actions that began with the arrival of Polynesians and continue to this day. With the destruction of habitat, populations of native birds began to decline. Scientists estimate that 40 or more bird species vanish during the Polynesian period. The remaining habitats of native birds were further impacted after Captain Cook's arrival in 1778. Over the last two centuries, 
the introduction of non-native plants and animals accelerated dramatically. Mental people introduced cattle, goats, pigs, deer, and sheep. Native plants that evolved in the absence of grazing mammals had no thorns or poison to ward off these large animals, and Hawaii's native forests suffered. Demands for lumber and firewood by the growing population led to the clearing of entire hillsides by the early 1900s. Foresters initiated a wide-scale replanting program with non-native trees imported from all over the world. During this time, the Hawaii Territorial Government rounded up some of the feral cattle and sheep and removed them from forest reserves. Fences were then constructed to keep feral animals out. However, native bird populations continued to decline. Today, introduced animals, including pigs, rats, mongoose, and non-native birds, all have an impact on native forests. The starchy core of native tree ferns is a favored food of pigs. They knock the tree ferns down, feed on the starch, and leave behind a breeding site for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes then spread avian diseases. Avian diseases were introduced to the islands by non-native birds. Native birds, like the native Hawaiian people, had no immunity to introduce diseases, and their populations suffered, particularly at low elevations where mosquitoes are abundant. Such unfortunate introductions of both plants and animals have had a tremendous impact on native ecosystems. Today, pristine forests can be found only in the most inaccessible areas. Most of Hawaii's endangered land birds occur on Kauai, Maui, and Hawaii. In the Alaka'i Swamp on Kauai, Old Hawaii still thrives in the humming of native insects, in the breezes that blow through lehua blossoms, and in the songs of native birds. Nectar from a lehua blossom provides food for the apapane. Insects become a meal for the elepaio. The akepa shares this wilderness habitat with six endangered species, including the Akia Loa. The Akia Loa once flourished in the island's forests. Today, it is nearly extinct, if not already gone. In the remote reaches of the Alaka'i, the enchanting call of the O'o drifts through the mist-shrouded forests. Its call goes unanswered. Scientists fear that this may be the last O'o. In lush Ohia forests, high on rugged eastern slopes of Haleakala, the rare and beautiful Akohe Kohe, or crested honey creeper, makes its home. Such havens provide refuge for other native birds of Maui, including the Maui creeper and the recently discovered Po'o'uli. On the island of Hawaii, the i'o, or Hawaiian hawk, makes its home. A symbol of royalty in Hawaiian legend, the i'o is now endangered. A more common resident, the i'ivi, is frequently seen darting among the blossoms of native trees. Its song and brilliant red plumage enliven the ohia forests. I'ivi also share Mamane Nai of woodland with the endangered Palila. Palila rely on the green seed pods of Mamane trees as a primary source of food. Damage to Mamane trees by browsing sheep has threatened the Palila's survival. The state has now removed sheep from the Palila's Mauna Kea habitat. Cooperation among government agencies, 
private landowners and organizations such as the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii has led to the establishment of nature preserves. One such reserve, the Hakalau Forest National Wildlife Refuge, provides habitat for a number of endangered species. Eight other reserves, totaling over 15,000 acres, have been acquired by the Nature Conservancy. In the distant Northwest Hawaiian Islands, water birds like the Laysan duck find havens in wildlife sanctuaries managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is only one of a complex of refuges the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages for native wildlife. Eighteen natural area reserves are managed by the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, encompassing over a hundred thousand acres on five of the main islands. These preserves provide habitat for endangered plants and animals. If a population of native birds drops dangerously low, a captive breeding program can provide an alternative means keeping the population alive. The first such program in Hawaii dates back to 1949, when our state bird, the nene, was brought back from the brink of extinction. The nene population had dropped to an estimated 25 birds when the state initiated a program to help save the species. Since the beginning of the captive bearing, rearing program, we've raised close to 2,000 nene in captivity at the project on the island. Birds were released on the island of Maui and at three or four locations on the island of Hawaii. The released birds have helped to increase the nene's population, but nene are not breeding successfully in the wild. One of the problems is after you raise nene in captivity, they're very tame as you see here, and take them out and put them into a wild situation. They're not as easily adapting to this because they're used to being fed and cared for. So we use a gentle release program. We put them in cages out in the wild areas and feed them these kinds of foods plus the wild kinds of foods. And over a period of weeks, we train them to eat only the wild foods and then open the cages. And they are allowed to go free and mix with the wild birds. There are problems of predation. The birds may mate and have eggs and nests. And the birds may hatch out of the nest. But at that point, they become vulnerable or in danger from predation, primarily mongoose, cats, and dogs. And there is a problem sometimes with illegal hunting, even now, although the nene is fully protected. The Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources has developed a new facility at Olinda, Maui, to breed the endangered alala, or Hawaiian crow, in captivity. Once common in flocks on the corner side of the island of Hawaii, the alala is now endangered. Fewer than 10 alala are believed to exist in the wild. Researchers hope to release the young and increase the wild population. The survival of the alala and other endangered species will require that research programs be funded and that suitable habitat be preserved and managed. To ensure that there is legislative support for these programs, the public needs to aware of Hawaii's native wildlife. Performers, painters, and teachers are actively promoting awareness. What I try to reveal to people through my paintings is just the beauty of the Hawaiian wilderness and the, um, the diversity of the different environments. You know, we've got, we've got beautiful oceans and misty rainforests, snow-capped volcanoes, deserts. You know, we've got all kinds of stuff. 
And a lot of people in Hawaii don't know they're even out there. And a lot of these places with native animals and native plants, they're inaccessible to the general public. You know, some, some places people aren't even allowed to go. So through my paintings, I can kind of bring nature to, to the person, you know, so um, they can at least imagine or experience it in the painting. And if they really smell the smells and hear the sound. Young people in Hawaii could learn by taking advantage of a, of a few programs that exist. Uh, if they're at the high school or intermediate school level, they could contact the Sierra Club, a, a hiking club in their school. Their, their procedures and ways which the club could do that. That would enable them with their friends to get out and get it. Uh, they could, if they want to work uh, with you and volunteer at the Hawaii Nature Center, there, there might be a place for them. Uh, they can take uh, summer classes at the uh, Bishop Museum. Uh, the Hawaii Nature Center is one where children, particularly kindergarten through fourth grade, enjoy visiting a, a stream environment, a valley environment. It has a program where school groups can visit and have a half-day interpretation of that setting. And Moana Gardens Foundation, with which I'm, uh, has a program where our staff will meet with the teachers and help them plan their classroom work and come into the classroom to teach feel they need help with and then take the classes on field trips to experience those areas. The uh, Sierra Club Hawaii chapter has a service trip program. It takes high school, college aged and older uh, to various islands to do conservation projects that wouldn't. They spend their time fencing, uh, fencing out feral animals that are damaging native systems. They go into not just weed control, that is pulling weeds. They build trail. They spend maybe two weeks in the wild. You don't have to spend time in the wild to save native species, since now played a key role in saving a native seabird, the shearwater. These seabirds were thought to be near extinction until their nesting grounds were discovered high on mountainous ridges. A head out to sea when their chicks are remain in their burrows until hunger urges them to make their first flight to sea. Fledged on the night of a new moon, are confused by the bright lights of them to become temporarily blinded and buildings and other obstructions. Vulnerable to auto traffic and roaming cats and dogs. People of Kauai have been alerted to the problem. Each year we have uh, a news release that asks the general public to pick up these birds them to the nearest fire station where we have set up Shearwater aid stations. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the District and Wildlife cooperated on this project by putting up these aid stations around the locations. And to our surprise, the first year we had over 800 birds turned in by the public. And since 1978, we've had uh, between 1,300 and 1,800 birds turned in each year. It's a rather large problem, and it seems to be increasing as time goes on. We're beginning to see uh, quite a bit of conflict between urbanization and the native wildlife. Going to the source of the problem, the Nature Conservancy and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have purchased a The electric company has placed the shields on street lights, and the lights now reflect in a downward direction. If the fallen birds are suspected of having internal injuries, they are taken to a hospital area where they are weighed, fed, and given water. When they're strong enough to fly, the birds are taken to a release site near Lihue. Before being released, the fledgling birds are banded. This gives researchers an opportunity to learn more about the birds' survival rate. This uh, project has been extremely successful in getting the Kauai citizens to help take care of these uh, newell shearwaters that fall on the roads. We've had tremendous uh, success. It's very gratifying to see the public take such an interest in a native seabird that is suffering from uh, something that is caused by man. And it has been very successful. Uh, more than 90% of the birds that are recorded fallen each year are successfully re It is difficult to put a value on our native birds. 
considered by some people to be fascinating and unique. Hawaii's birds have no apparent utility except as pollinators of native plants, dispersers of seeds, and consumers of insects. Why then should we make the effort to save them from extinction? There are a lot of reasons to save endangered birds. As a biologist, I would say we want to save them because they're the most unique example among the birds of spectacular evolution. One species affects another species. You take one species out, somehow it hurts the ecosystem a small amount. These species in a native ecosystem all working together have been likened to rivets in an airplane. Let's just say you're riding on an airliner and you're looking out the window and you see a rivet. The rivets are holding the airplane together on the wing. One of them pop out. Well, that's like losing a native species, letting a species become extinct. No big thing. You got thousands of rivets in that wing. You got thousands of native species, insects and plants. Then you see another rivet go out on that wing and another rivet go and another rivet. Then you start getting worried. How many rivets have to go before the wing holds? How many native species have to go before our quality of life is affected? I think we should make the effort to save endangered Hawaiian birds because birds, like other things Hawaiian, are very special and unique to Hawaii. And they're the things that make Hawaii different from any place else in the world. Whether generations to come will enjoy the unique and beautiful birds that evolved over millions of years in Hawaii will depend on the actions we take today. <laughs>